about kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of intracranial pressure, which would be high intracranial pressure. And in the context of EDS, I will say that less is known about the connections between high pressure headaches and EDS. And so about two thirds of this talk over the next 15 minutes, it's gonna be a little bit more fact-based on diagnosis and management. And then the last third is gonna be mainly conjecture to try to figure out it, number one, is there a connection? We believe that the likelihood of having high pressure headaches is higher in the EDS population, but we don't know for sure. They haven't been large studies. And second, what is the connection or what are some possible links? I have no disclosures. So high pressure headaches in general, when they're presenting to a um, primary care doctor or to a neurologist, we're usually thinking about headache red flags. Um, patients who have headaches that are worse lying down compared to sitting or standing, patients who have headaches that wake them from sleep at night. And this certainly pertains to the high pressure headaches that are the case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Now, I'm gonna be using the term pseudotumor cerebri and IIH interchangeably. There is some controversy in the literature which term, some people prefer one term and some people prefer another, but that's beyond the scope of this brief talk. So I'm probably gonna be using both terms. Um, but basically this is a diagnosis that's made by excluding structural causes, or should I say obvious structural causes for high pressure in the head. Among them mass effect, vascular causes, as well as CSF outflow obstruction. The typical presentation, as I mentioned, is one of headaches. And so a patient will typically come in with headaches, um, usually positional headaches, papilledema, and visual disturbances. And we'll get to a little bit more of the clinical presentation in a moment. But listening now to the low pressure headaches, you should start to think about some similarities in the presentation between low and high pressure headaches. And in fact, only until recently did I realize there's substantial overlap of symptoms, including visual symptoms, even migrainous features to both headache disorders. The cause of pseudotumor is unknown. We know about many metabolic and also some structural risk factors, which I'll get into in a little bit, but we really don't know what causes pseudotumor. We don't know why um, there's high pressure in the head without expansion of the ventricles. It doesn't totally make sense. Is it overproduction of CSF? Is it underabsorption of CSF? Are there um, microthrombi? So we do know that patients are hypercoagulable even in the absence of a clear clot in their venous system, they have a higher likelihood of developing this disorder. And we also think about maybe there's a venous outflow partial obstruction, something that in the past we wouldn't have thought was clinically relevant, but maybe now we need to reconsider, and I'll get to some of those points. Looking at the incidence, so this is considered a rare disorder. It's actually more common in a particular demographic. So the patient who will typically present to my office where we have a higher clinical suspicion for pseudotumor is a young woman of childbearing age and often overweight. They have about you know, almost 20-fold um, higher likelihood of developing pseudotumor. That said, anybody can get pseudotumor, and I've seen patients of all um, shapes and sizes develop pseudotumor, and so it should be on the radar regardless of the demographic. One thing about the demographic is we don't know, so why this population? So first looking at obesity, is it the actual central obesity? So um, around the abdomen that raises the venous pressures leading to venous congestion in the head? Or is it the adipose tissue functioning as an endocrine organ and secreting something that's raising pressure in the head? That we don't know. And also the female preponderance of this disorder is very mysterious. So we do know a little bit about hormones. We know that patients with certain endocrinopathies actually have higher incidence of pseudotumor. We know that certain birth control pills and progesterone implants, um, patients will have a higher likelihood of pseudotumor. We see pseudotumor in pregnancy, although it hasn't been definitely designated as higher likelihood in pregnancy, but much is to be learned about hormones. Now, I'm a women's health neurologist, and so this is an area of interest for me. The presenting symptoms of pseudotumor I've already mentioned. I will say that not everybody gets a headache. I also think it's very interesting that patients don't come with a static visual loss. Often they'll have transient visual obscurations, and you'd think it would be going from standing to lying down, but it can actually be with any movement. They might sit up, start to see something cloudy that then vanishes and only to switch positions and have it happen again. Tinnitus is very common, eye pain, 
Um, you'd have to have a normal um, neuro exam in order to meet criteria for this. In fact, you have to be awake and alert. You can't diagnose this in a comatose patient, but um, cranial neuropathies um, can be seen and are allowed. Now, this is not a benign condition. This can cause permanent visual impairment or loss in up to 10% if we leave this untreated. The way that we monitor these patients in the past compared to now has changed. We typically actually monitor very closely with ophthalmologists doing serial eye exams, often with retinal photography and visual fields. And the degree of um, visual loss does seem to run along with the degree of papilledema on the eye exam. There's diagnostic criteria, which I'm not gonna get heavily into, but suffice to say that you can present with pseudotumor without a headache, although it's very controversial. But we'll also see patients with persistent headache, um, characteristic findings, elevated opening pressure, and without papilledema. And so there have been some updates to this criteria over the years. There are some uh, characteristic radiographic findings. And again, these are not considered structural causes of the disease. They're considered findings that we'll see in this population. So for example, um, flattened globes, tortuous vessels with expansion of the CSF around the optic nerves. Um, we'll see a partially empty cella, which is basically the pituitary being squashed out of the way as CSF fills that space. And then this finding that I think is very interesting, which is transverse venous sinus uh, stenosis. I didn't write here, but it's usually bilateral transverse venous sinus stenosis. And this is interesting because it's sort of a chicken or egg phenomenon. Over 90% of patients with pseudotumor have this finding, but we don't know if they started out with stenotic vessels that then went into this kind of positive feedback loop where there's increasing pressure in the head that's then exerting pressure on the um, venous sinuses, causing further narrowing and thus raising the intracranial pressure. Um, it's, it's a little bit mysterious. Um, I will say that there are cases so where we'll see this finding on the MRV, we'll do a tap, we'll take off CSF, and the venous sinuses will open up. But because we don't know how much of this is a risk factor, looking to the EDS population, we don't know how many or what percentage of patients with EDS have this finding already, even with, um, without symptoms. Um, but it brings up the point of venous um, stenting as a potential uh, solution to this disorder, which I'll talk about in a moment. I'm not going to go in detail through the uh, meta uh, metabolic or medical conditions that can predispose towards pseudotumor, but the list includes endocrinopathies, medications, um, and certain medical conditions. Now, I mentioned that there, it's not a disorder of structural or obstruction, um, but um, I have mentioned that elevated intra-abdominal pressure, so in the case of obesity and probably pregnancy too, can be risks. Poor venous outflow, as I mentioned just now. And then this is very interesting, and this should prompt thinking about the um, uh, EDS population as well. So even though uh, you would think Chiari should be a uh, diagnostic exclusion for this disorder, however, um, we do know that patients with IIH or pseudotumor cerebri actually have a higher um, incidence of Chiari. And they also have a higher incidence of these low-lying tonsils that don't meet criteria for Chiari malformation and don't have the same cranial wall shape, et cetera. And so this is interesting because it's not thought to be the problem, but it is, it is considered a risk factor. The treatments are mainly medical, so many patients do very well with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, which reduce CSF production. Um, I tend to use topiramate in patients who are not pregnant because it is um, teratog more teratogenic. There's more evidence for it compared to acetazolamide. Um, and this uh, IIH treatment trial a few years ago compared diet, so a low-sodium weight reduction diet compared to the diet plus acetazolamide in patients with the drug plus the diet did better than patients on diet alone. I only bring up this small study of octreotide because it's an IGF um, uh, inhibitor and growth hormone inhibitor, and patients with elevated IGF and growth hormone are actually in the risk category for pseudotumor cerebri. And I'm gonna mention that in uh, a slide or two as it relates to EDS. Um, when treatments fail, we do um, need our surgical colleagues to intervene. And so 
In our institution, we tend to do more with CSF diversion than optic nerve sheath fenestration, although both have evidence behind them. Um, there is a head-to-head -head trial called the SITE trial that's going on right now comparing these two surgical modalities to see which one um, is better for patients with progressive visual loss and headaches in spite of maximal medical therapy. And I've already mentioned venous stenting, which isn't in this trial, but there is actually some substantial evidence. It's a controversial practice because um, people are concerned, well, maybe these stents will migrate. A lot of this is um, technique dependent, although um, you know, in our institution, um, we have a, a very robust um, uh, vascular interventional service. And there are at least three clinical trials in North America recruiting looking at venous stenting for this condition. So we'll probably hear more in the next few years. And now for the end, which is the links between EDS and IIH. Number one, is there a link? Now that we don't know, but hearing some of these promising um, and very inspiring talks this morning, looking at these patient registries, this might be our best chance at actually finding some big, um, you know, major epidemiological um, uh, data uh, linking these two conditions. Now, if you actually just search IIH and um, EDS, you're going to find this case report. So a lot of this comes from this case report that was published a few years ago of a 36-year-old woman who was found to have IIH and had elevated IGF-1 levels. And she was treated. And later on, she was diagnosed with EDS based on, you know, in retrospect, what was a clear hypermobility syndrome but meeting criteria because she had TMJ luxation. And so this raised the question of the role of IGF-1 um, if this, is, if this um, hormone is elevated in patients with EDS, could this be a potential link between IIH and EDS, which is why I mentioned the octreotide early on. So that's one possible link. Could it be volume expansion? Um, that's a big question. Secondly, we know, and again, I'm pooling EDS types, but I think that you know, we have to think broadly about the connective tissues, the ligaments. We also think about the vasculature, even in patients without the clear vascular form of EDS. But if venous insufficiency or even the shape of the venous sinuses, these are things that have not been uh, studied um, among EDS patients, but might actually predispose these patients towards IIH. This is something that we don't know. And finally, this question of this tonsillar ectopia and or Chiari. Now, listening to the last talk, you know, when we think about intracranial hypotension, we think about brain sag, we think about everything kind of dipping down, including the cerebellar tonsils. Now, I've now had two patients in the last year where we diagnosed IIH during pregnancy, because I see a lot of pregnancy neurology, they were treated successfully, and then the headaches returned, and there was something unusual. And in both cases, they required a repeat spinal tap. In one case, we tapped her, and even though she looked like a high-pressure headache, she had a normal pressure, and subsequently, she developed really intractable low-pressure headaches. The second case, who I actually just saw last week, same scenario, except when we tapped her, she had a low opening pressure, and then she had even worse low pressure headaches, and she required two blood patches with um, sub substantial improvement but not normalization. Looking at those cases, the question we should be able to kind of um, back up and say, could these patients have a disorder of their connective tissues? How does somebody go from high to low pressure? You know, years ago in residency, we were told if you have a patient with pseudotumor and you tap them and you leave a little hole, Great, because that's the treatment for the condition. But now, the more of these cases we see where they go from high to low pressure, we start to think about pressure on a continuum. And so with the cerebellar tonsils, could it be that there's this partial obstruction and the brain is moving around in the cranial vault? And so we're kind of toggling back and forth between low and high pressure. Again, this is a mystery, but I think with better uh, imaging techniques, we may be able to solve it. I'm going to skip this slide, but suffice to say that patients with EDS have a high likelihood of getting migraine, another pain disorder. And so one question is, could these patients be actually just more prone to the pain that's inflicted by the fluctuation of pressures? And that's certainly a possibility. And so in my opinion, we need a lot more research into this area. We need to know, is there a higher likelihood? What are the risk factors? I'm personally interested in the hormones and the links between the sex hormones in particular. I think pregnancy, we accept as um, 
you know, it, it's well known that there's increased joint laxity that happens during pregnancy. We know about many pregnant related consequences of having EDS or other connective tissue diseases, but we don't know much, enough about the brain and what's happening to the brain and the headaches um, during pregnancy, which is a high hormone and also high weight state. And we also don't know about these other causes of intracranial hypertension, spe uh, specifically the vasculature. So I didn't mention this, but uh, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, which is a disorder in which there's impaired autoregulation in the brain, leading to increased cerebral edema in the back of the brain. In pregnancy, that's what we see in preeclampsia, eclampsia. We don't know if patients with EDS are at higher risk for that. But we don't know um, kind of what the blood vessels and the um, uh, autonomics are doing, um, you know, with regards to um, uh, high pressure headaches specifically. Now, I use lupus as an example, which is a very different disorder, but it is, and it's acquired connective tissue disorder. It's actually a risk factor for both press and IAH. We've always taken for granted it's because it's an autoimmune disease, but there might be more to the story than that. So I'm going to conclude, even before you came up. <laughs> And we're not taking any questions. <laughs> Thank you.